G'day pals, welcome back to a new video. Today, I wanted to talk about something that, in all honesty, I have been asked a lot. I know I say that all the time, but I really have been asked about this question quite a lot since I've been showing off more of Insignia, and since I've covered a lot of pixel art content, I think a lot of you who are making games are wondering, how do I take the art that I've created and animate it in the game? How do I actually control the logic and the playback of my animations to create gameplay? And this is a topic that I I feel quite confident about in the way that I implement it in my game, but I don't feel 100% confident to explain it to you in a way that is authoritative. There's a lot of different ways to approach this kind of thing, and uh, every game is different. So please just take it with a grain of salt. As I explain all this stuff, this isn't like a lecture in a university. This is just me talking about my experience with animators and state machines and hopefully you can learn something that you might find useful. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So uh, basically animators and state machines, what I want to talk about first is kind of like the school of gameplay that my game is kind of based on and the things that I've been kind of working towards and the reasons why I'm building the things the way that I am for my game. So the first thing you need to know is that I'm making a game that has fighting game style action. Concepts like positioning are important, moves and animations that bind the character to those moves are important. Uh, the concept of advantage and yo-me layers, or you could think of that as like rock, paper, scissors. Um, so the concept of some moves beating other moves and of course it's real time so you know the idea of reactions telegraphing those kinds of things there are a lot of games uh, in you know the 2d pixel art uh, action sort of subgenre that aren't fighting game style mechanics so you can think of like a twin stick shooter like a top down kind of game that wouldn't have quite the same concepts so for the purposes of the discussion i'm talking about really sort of like side scrolling almost like street fighter style mechanics the principal thing I want to talk about is action flow. Action flow is how I would describe the way that a fight plays out. This is really important. Those concepts that I described earlier, spacing, moves, all that kind of stuff, creates a scenario where at any given time, there's only one thing happening. And from that thing that's happening, there are options. Those options are dependent in like a competitive fighting game on the interaction of the two players and the choices they make, but any interaction has like a definite outcome and that constrains the flow chart, right? The things that can happen are limited beyond that point. And eventually that, you know, chain runs out and things reset. And so the fight in and of itself is this kind of like thing that is moving through time. That is a series of options and decisions that get made that then push that fight um, in a specific direction. You can think of it as a flow chart. Um, you can think of it however you want, but this is how I think about it. So let's look at an example. Here we have, you know, Street Fighter 3, Third Strike. This is the, uh, the very famous Evo Moment 37. And I just want to call out kind of what's happening here. So, you know, as we watch the gameplay, we can see that each of the characters, they have one sprite and only one sprite is active at a time. And that sprite tells us Kind of what state the character is in and that state describes what they can do from there so in this case we have uh, Daigo on the left playing Ken and Ken has uh, he's in a standing position he can walk forward he can walk back and uh, he can also do you know a number of moves not every move can be done from standing position some of his moves need to be done from the air or some of them uh, some of these actions can only take place if he's knocked down so we have a limited set of things that can happen and for Justin on the right here playing Chun-Li, his interpretation of what's happening and, and the decisions that he would make are dependent on what Daigo can do, what Ken can do. For this to be something that's fun to play and fun to watch, it's really important that the players and the audience can understand the scope of what's possible, right? And for that scope to be limited. And I wanna kind of like harp on that, that, that there is really a limited set of, of things, a finite set of states that things can be in. So when Chun-Li is doing an attack, she's not doing something else, right? If she's doing a kick, she's not also doing that same kick from the air, or she's not doing it while she's knocked down, or while she's doing a super animation. Once you're in a certain state, that state sort of persists until it finishes. And um, not every state 
has exactly one animation. So some states can be a path of animations. And in this case, Wen Chun uses her super, you can see there's like a whole series of animations. You know, these might have been authored separately. Maybe someone did, you know, three different parts of this, but as they appear in the game, they're played in sequence. So not every state is limited to one animation. And um, that's something that will become relevant a little bit later. So in this space, the word state gets used a lot. And this is what we use to describe the things that somebody can be doing, right? These are unique modules of behavior, and they're usually uh, described with verb words. So walk, run, fall, jump. These are things that something can do. And in the model of a state machine, so the thing that the states go into that actually drives them, you have this concept of obviously the, the action and then some kind of condition that exits that action. So how long are we doing this until? Until some time has passed or an animation is finished or a condition is met or uh, maybe a player input's released. So this concept of doing something until some other thing happens is, uh, is important. And that describes those states and the flow. So I've described states and that's like logic. The next thing is the actual visuals, right? The animations and the animator. So in this context, what is an animation? An animation is a list of frames, right? Sprites. Some of them have hitboxes, they might not. And they might have other properties as well, like uh, damage or velocity or whatever. And animations are played by an animator. And an animator is something that plays those frames in a sequence at a given frame rate. Sometimes those animations can be looped and the animator decides on a sprite based on the animation to place inside of a renderer. Okay, and in Unity, a renderer is like a sprite renderer. It's just something that then shows that in the game. So we're really describing the visual side of things that an entity in a game can do. And I think it's really important to think about the relationship between states and animations. So with pixel art games like Street Fighter, uh, unless you're doing some funky stuff where you're separating body parts, which can happen in certain games, you've usually got one sprite at a time representing the whole character. And that means you've got one animation playing at a time for an entity. You've also got, for logistics sake, one state at a time. Okay, so one animation at a time, one state at a time. And I think from this, there becomes like a kind of intuitive relationship between states and animations. From a gameplay standpoint, from the player's perspective, there should be a link between what something is doing and what it looks like something is doing, right? The visuals and the behavior should kind of be linked. It feels like they ought to be. And um, the whole purpose, obviously, for this is to communicate that action flow. So to come to the point, I think that a good strategy for devising any kind of way that you're going to show graphics in your game to represent the AI or the behavior of your enemies and your player, it's, it should take advantage of this, right? This relationship between the animations, the sprites and the logic. So I'm going to be playing here on the left some gameplay of Insignia, my game. And you can see here that I've got a pretty similar setup to Street Fighter. You know, we've got animations that are moves. Those moves have range and the enemies and characters can step in and out of that range. If someone gets attacked, they go into like a hurt state. And um, there are kind of things that can flow onto that. I've got parries, I've got air combos and juggles. I've got all kinds of stuff that can happen. And uh, that's kind of like proof that the strategy that I use at least has some utility. And I can at least report to you that like the way that I do this kind of stuff, uh, it's been a lot easier since I've started implementing the systems that I'm about to describe to you. So before we get too into the weeds about how I make this work from a logic side of things in, in the code, I wanna cover the very easy parts um, and that is the animator. So um, this is an example of a character that I've got in my game currently that I'm building out and this character can fight. So I've got simple animations like idle, I've got breathing, um, I've got running, this is kind of like more for combat. I've got a battle idle, so when the character is ready to attack and I've got a, like a slash that I'm working on and some jump frames as well. So what I do is I separate these into tags and I can do that in a sprite by pressing right click and pressing new tag and then I can define which frames that relates to. Then I have a script that I use by pressing shift T and what this does is just takes each of these tags and sends it to a sprite sheet. A sprite sheet is literally just all of those frames laid out horizontally or in a grid. And you can find that script on my Turbocharge Your A Sprite Workflow video on my YouTube channel. Once I've got these, where do they go? 
So what I do is I take those animation sprite sheets, I drag them into my project, and I put them in a folder for the character that they represent. So these are the sprite sheets, these are the animation frames. And the next thing I do is I make these multiples. So you click multiple on the import settings of the sprite and I slice them up in the engine. Okay, this is a way for me to just use Unity's default way of kind of like packaging sprite sheets. So it's one asset that has multiple frames associated. And I make sure I've got the pivot set uh, to a place that represents the center of that character's like mass. Now for any of you who have done game dev, particularly sprite work in Unity before, this should all be very familiar. And I imagine most of you from here would be using the animator. So the way that you would by default do this in Unity is you would have an animation and you would put frames uh, from your sprites into the frames of the animation. And then you would put those animations into uh, a blend tree, which is this space here. Now, personally, I don't use these systems primarily because they're not really designed for sprites and it's really designed for 3D models. So if you're making like a 3D game, you would expect for a character to be able to maybe run and uh, transition into a jump, maybe run while they're shooting if they have a gun, stuff like that. With 3D models, because all of the stuff is live, you can imagine, you know, wanting to be able to sort of like jump into a crouch and to be able to interpolate or transition between those animations. So the concept of animations playing at the same time in 3D graphics is not unreasonable based on the fact that you know the the geometry is just models and so you can you can blend things and you can change things while the game is live not so with sprites so one thing that a system like uh, unity's animator can't do is answer the question which animation is playing right now and on what frame and that's something that i think a lot of developers of pixel art games need to know right like what animation is playing what, what sprite is playing right now what frame are we on in this animation? Because that's how you've authored your content, right? Like maybe on frame five, I want this character like to have a dust particle or maybe on frame four, I want to do some kind of like hitbox. And so these specific like frame specific timings that match the way that you've built the animation need to be somehow um, preserved and um, replicated or at least supported by your animation system. What I've done is made a much simpler thing than the animator. I built a little plugin that's called Retrobox. And all this does is it takes the sprites that I created in a sprite, I place them in here, and it just keeps them as an array in what's called a scriptable object. Uh, and that's called a box sheet. That's what I call it in my system. So this box sheet is fundamentally just a list of sprites. You don't need this animator to do any of that you can literally just drop a bunch of sprites into a script and play through them. That's all you really need to do to make your own primitive kind of animator and animation. For my needs, I also have hitboxes. That's why my system is a little bit more complicated and can do things like, you know, I can place damage properties on hitboxes on frame two of, a, of an animation. If you're interested in doing that in your game, uh, maybe I can cover that in another video, but that's what I've got working for me. The next thing is actually the animator. And the animator is really just a script that plays those frames. That's all it is. So I don't want to intimidate you. My animator is very complicated um, because of all that hitbox stuff and managing the hitboxes. That's all done in the script. But I can show you very quickly what the, the play looks like. So all we do is we pass in a sheet. This is like a sprite sheet. We give it a frame rate. We say whether or not it's looping and whether or not we want to override and this usually comes into play if I want to start the same animation from the beginning. So whenever I want to play an animation in the script, I just say animator, play this animation at this frame rate. So now in the update loop, what you need to focus on is like right here. All that's really happening is I'm saying how much time has elapsed since we started playing the animation that we're currently playing and what frame does that correspond to at the current frame rate? That's all this is. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about how to set that up, you can watch my eight directional walk animation video. That's a little bit different from this kind of gameplay, but in terms of the fundamental principles of like playing an animation and picking a frame based on how much time has elapsed, that's all covered there. And it's, it's really simple. It's not complicated at all. That's how I play animations in my game. In Unity, you have a system that has a series of parameters, right, up here. And those parameters infer what animation should be playing based on what's happening. 
So you have, for example, grounded or, you know, jumping or whatever. And the animation system kind of guesses what it needs to be doing based on what is being set by the script, based on these like parameters. That's kind of like one way of doing it. It's kind of like descriptive. It's trying to describe what's happening. But in my system, I have what's more prescriptive. So rather than trying to figure out what's happening, all of my animations are being decided. They're hard coded in the script. I say, play this animation right now. So let me give you a very simple example. This is a character, the same character, and I'll show you kind of some behavior that they can do. So in this one, all they're doing is running and they can jump at me. And if they are close, they can attack. And if they're far away, they'll just run until they get close enough. So it's very simple. The logic, you can see kind of what's happening. You can see there's a range for the attack. You can see that they'll keep running until they reach that range and then they'll do the jump. And so the question then is like, how do I lay out this logic? So the way that I drive all of my AI and the animations that get played comes from what's called a behavior state tree. This is an implementation of a finite state machine, if you've heard of those. And it's one that I've kind of come up with, or at least the implementation is one that I've come up with as I've been working on my game. And the way that this is structured is basically everything that can be done, everything that exists in this, in this tree is considered a state. And a state can have child states underneath it. So this is a recursive or nested data structure. And at any given time, every frame, it will do the update of the selected state. So for example, um, Armin, the main character of my game, he might have a player state behavior. And that player can be doing either a hurt or a control. And control can be, you could be on the ground or you could be in the air. And the substates of ground are idling, skidding, walking, running, crouching, all of those things. And each of these at the very bottom describes really specifically an animation, right? We have an idle animation, a skid animation, a walk animation. And at the top, they're more like strategies, right? They're more like abstract. This hierarchy is really important. Abstract at the top, specific at the bottom. And in the case of like an enemy, it actually is a lot more easy to understand that like the top line states, they're like the brains of what's happening. We could be engaged in combat or we could be patrolling. And if we patrol, we go into one of two states, you know, idle or walk. And the way that the system works is what's active is the branch. It's not that like idle is the state on its own. It's that like the current state is patrol idle. Like that's one state or engage, attack, you know, projectile. That's all active at the same time. And every frame enemy says, all right, I'm going to do my selected state, which is engage update. And then engage says, okay, I'm going to do my update. And then I'm going to do the update of my selected state, which is attack, etc. all the way till we hit the bottom. And at the bottom, that's where those animations live. And this system for me has been really robust. It's been really, really straightforward for me to define these. The complexity is very manageable because it's balanced quite well. That is to say, this walk animation and the logic that governs what a walk is and how it behaves is defined once in one spot in my code, right? In its own class. Any more complex behavior about walking can be defined in a behavior above that that has a walk. So patrolling, right? Walking around, looking to see if there's, uh, you know, the main player is like in your vision or whatever, maybe stopping and checking for a second. Like that behavior is kind of more complex and more abstract than just walking. And so I describe what a patrol is and I describe a patrol as something that has a walk. So it uses walk to do the things that it's trying to do. And so what that does is it allows me to essentially not have to worry about the, the crossing over. There's no, there's nothing about the way this is defined that kind of like messes around with any of this other stuff. And it also means that properties like movement speed are not bound to the top line behavior. They can be custom. So patrols walk, 
can be, you know, one meter per second. But maybe chase would also have a walk and walk is technically just, it's any, it's run, walk, whatever, it's ground, ground movement. So the walk animation for chase can be one that's a lot faster, it looks like it's running. And the frame rate here or the move rate, the movement speed here can be three meters per second. So that's defined, you know, under the logic that governs the thing that we want to be moving that fast. The separation of concerns when we talk about like software engineering is really well managed in a system like this. To be clear, in this system, every single one of these nodes in this tree is its own class. In fact, every single one of these is their own component. Now I'll show you the kind of like one of the downsides to implementing things that way. The inspector becomes pretty heavy. Um, so this is Armin, this is the main character for my game. And obviously he's gonna be the most complex because he is everything that can possibly happen you know, involves him. So this is just the top line set of behaviors. And then inside of that, there are combat behaviors. I've got a weapon manager. I've got different combat states like being knocked down, tumble, grabbed. Uh, and then I've got be inside of that, the different weapons. So this is like sword. Sword has an attack combo, an air combo, a parry, repost. You could say this is like an issue. But in reality, this is kind of like an accurate representation of the complexity of the thing that I built. So yes, it's complicated, but so is the character itself. If you want the depth of the character's behavior to be really deep and to be able to do all these different intelligent things in different scenarios, you know, wield different weapons and um, have all these different combat states, you kind of need to describe that somewhere. <laughs> And so the question is really, what is the best way to do that from like an engineering perspective and also from a design perspective, working with that system, what is the interface for that? The one thing that I do miss a little bit is having some kind of like visualization, some kind of UI. The animators blend tree in Unity is pretty useful because when you're playing the game back, you can see the flow of that logic being passed through the animator. For me, it's a little more complicated because the job of my behavior state tree is not just to show what animation is playing, but to show what behaviors are playing, what that logic tree looks like. And so short of creating a new editor for that and a new visualizer, you know, that's something that I have to do a bit more thinking about as I'm watching an enemy for the, like debugging purposes. It's actually like a lot harder for me to think about, okay, well, if it's not doing what I want it to do, what is it doing? And in this situation, like I've got this little like debug widget. This is like the breadcrumbs of the states. So we're currently doing our boss behavior. We are engaged. So we're fighting Armin, that means we can see him. And we're currently doing leap. That's like the more specific thing that we're doing. So what else can I tell you? I mean, that's how I've currently got it working. As far as the architecture of a behavior state, most mono behaviors have start, update, fixed update and then maybe like on destroy or something like that okay and in normal mono behaviors you expect those to run every single frame well you expect start to run at the beginning uh, update and fixed update to run you know almost every frame as per the design and then when the thing is destroyed you would play on destroy or on disable but because I've got a behavior state tree and only the active states should be playing I've kind of got these like mimic versions of those functions I've got enter, and this happens when the state is set by its parent. I have do, which is like update, and I have fixed do, which is like fixed update. Uh, and then I have exit for when the state is, uh, is leaving. And the way that it works is these don't run on their own. These get run by their parent. And so this this kind of like recursive, kind of like passing of the torch down every single frame from the you know main game object that's driving to its active child state all the way down an actual enemy so like the top the, the top game object that does have the update and the fixed update all it does is it says every single frame state dot do and state dot fixed do and from there that kicks off that recursive chain so in this case like its state will be like engage record engage and it says whatever our state is do that in this case it's going to be engaged so I can go in there and ha have a look 
and then that's got its do and this will be called because this was state.do and then this has some states too it's got chase and it's got leap and it's got slash and so it's going to be setting which state it should be in if it's complete what state were we in what were we doing what should we be doing next this is where all of that branching logic comes in about what what we should be doing at the end of a state and then I just say like, okay, well then you should be now slashing or you should be chasing or whatever. And then I can check again. I go one deeper. Okay. So this is chase. Chase is a behavior state and it has a navigate uh, and it has some other properties. And so on its do, which gets called from above, uh, you know, it tells its state to do its thing. And in, that, in this case, that's the navigate. And again, right down at the bottom, navigate then says, okay, now we're going to be doing the thing that we need to do, which is walking from A to B, moving our velocity. And so that happens every frame, that kind of like circuitry happens. And that's how I do it. That's how I run through something like this. So this has the update at the top and then everything else I call do. That's basically how I've been doing all of my enemy AI since the start of 2020. What I used to do was write like every single enemy's entire set of behavior every single time i made a new enemy i would copy and paste code for walking copy and paste code for idle copy and paste code for hurt copy and paste code for uh, defining how to move between states that was fine for like three or four enemies but once i got into chapter two of my game where i'm trying to do like scale here i'm trying to have like 20 30 enemies by the end of the game being able to reuse stuff and to define these things in the abstract is really really important having this model where at the bottom i just plug in the animation for the character that's what makes this really easy for me because from this context all i have to do is just think about well what does the character do so like i want them to like run at the player character and then do a big jump into an attack or whatever it is i can describe those verbs and they're already defined in the game. And all I'm doing as a designer here is just drawing what that looks like, what those frames look like. Then I can just plug them in, pair them up and have that play out in the game. For any game developer, if you're looking to implement a solution, something that scales and meets the needs that you have as a designer is the most important thing. And so I think if you're approaching this kind of endeavor for your own game and you're looking to build a more concrete system that your logic and your animations are built upon, I think that it's naturally a really good approach to first define what it is that you want. For me, tying animations to states is really important. And having those states prescribe the animations directly to me makes a lot of sense because I wanted to do something that is similar to a fighting game. You need to be able to see what moves are playing out. You need to have those moves lock you in. Having that state tree be finite is really important because you can't be doing multiple animations at once. So one thing at a time makes it very easy for the player to understand what enemies are doing. It means that I'm forced to add those concepts of like telegraphing and cooldowns and spacing into the actual design of the enemies. I have to do those things because my system forces me to do them. And the same thing applies to the visuals. To me, the concept of having the frame rate be determined when the animation is actually instanced. So when I, when I try to play an animation, setting the frame rate there makes a lot of sense to me uh, because I can say, well, in this context, I want this animation to play 10 frames per second. But in this context, I want to play it 15 frames per second. That's something that allows me to have a little bit more control and so having my own animator means I can set that where I want it to be and additionally like I don't have transitions in my game I don't have this concept of like something blending from one state to another because they're all sprites and in sprite animation it's very rare to have transitions you can have transition states but animation transitions are uh, in this context just not really a part of it so there you go I hope that was a good tour and I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Hey pal, thanks for watching and thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below 
And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button, and then YouTube will tell me, and then I'll make more videos. That's nice. Thanks again, and uh, until next time.